Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. And welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm your host, Tom Bourne. With me today is the absolutely awesome David Woolwich. David, how are you? Not too bad, mate, yourself. Fantastic. David, uh, in Perth, I believe. I am. I am in sunny, overly warm, hot Perth at the moment. Uh, yes. Beautiful. I, sh- I, I say I believe, but I do know because you do run the uh, Safety Differently Book Club in Perth and you've been putting that on literally off your own back for quite a while. Yeah, quite a while. Um, and you've had some absolutely marvellous speakers. Um, some had, amazing speakers from all over Australia. Yep. Yeah. Andrew. And you, Andrew. Barrett. Barrett, yep, yep, yep. And we've had Cam, Cam Stevens. Cam. That, that I know Cam of. Tristan Casey. Tristan Casey. Yeah, that was a big one. And yeah. I almost called them the two Ronnies this morning, and then I went, oh, <laughs> they're, they're not the two Ronnies. <laughs> the two Bretts. The two Bretts. Yeah, from, from New Zealand. So yeah. well, well done. I'll tell you what, I've really appreciated being able to go to them when I've been able to. I wish I could get to more, but... Um, Enough of... been good. It's been good having you when you come as well, to be honest with Tom. It's it's one of those things, isn't it? It's 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 a community um, oh. of people. And, you know, we all share similar interests and similar points of view and we want to learn. And it's great when people can just come together and do that kind of thing. And it's amazing when we do those, you know, small number of speakers you mentioned there. Grateful to each and every one of them because they don't have to do what they do. They don't get paid to do it. If mm. anything, it probably costs some money to come and and talk because they need to organize accommodation and sometimes they work it off the back of other engagements that they're doing here in WA but sometimes they're not sometimes they just put their own time and their own resource and their own money into coming and having a chat with safety professionals in Perth which is amazing and I'm very 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 grateful for each and every one yeah and you're right about that sense of community I gotta be honest and say I did not experience at all until I came to Perth uh, come to Perth, and it's not just the guests who are outstanding. You get some genuine, super heavyweights of the safety industry turning up in the audience. They're just there. I'm just like, they, they're just there. Look at who's yeah. here. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for doing that. I can tell you, I do appreciate it. I really do. Oh, well, speaking of heavyweights, at the last event with the two brands, we had Kim Bancroft in the audience. It's like... That's 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 the sort of get much caliber, than... cal- caliber of guest I'm talking about. I, exactly. I was I got to be honest and say I was too intimidated, too shy to actually go and say hi. hi. But I probably should have because I'll probably never get that chance again. But yeah, it was just <laughs> good to be in the same room as some of these people. Yep. All right, David. Apart from talking about uh, safety differently, book club. I know a little bit about you professionally because we've met, we've talked, we've. Um, you know, touch base a few times. But for those who don't know you, can you tell us a bit about your professional journey so far? In which capacity, my safety capacity or prior to that? Um, I've got a bit of a dualistic life, to be honest with you. Before I came to Australia, I came to Australia in 2006. Um, and even since coming to Australia, I've dabbled around in different things. Um, but if you're referencing my safety profession solely, um, started almost 10 years ago I was I'd, I'd moved out of the resources uh, and mining sector I could see it wasn't it was due for another downturn and I, I needed mm. a bit of stability I was married at the time with a house and commitments so I um I got out of the resources sector and thought well what's the most secure industry to get into uh, local government, government in general, and I managed to find a job working for the uh, city of Netherlands. Um, and yeah, I was working there in lots of different capacities, primarily in the operation side of things. So parks, uh, irrigation, um, heavy equipment, that sort of thing, traffic management, all those types of areas. And I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I, I needed to uh, you know, I need to study. I like studying. It's something that I've been studying nonstop pretty much since about 2015, 2016. And um, I just kept on asking them if they put me through 
different courses and they surf fours here and there. And then they said, well, why don't you become a safety rep? It's obviously, you know, it'll give you something extra to do. And I said, yeah, okay, that sounds good. It'll take up a bit more time instead of me sitting in, sitting on my own because I was recently separated, the, you know, at that point and I just wanted to keep busy. So I said, become a safety rep. I said, yeah, no worries. Cert for, yeah, no worries. So I completed that within a few months. And then this, I said, well, can I do my diploma? And they said, yeah, okay, just shut up and just go <laughs> on studying. And then when I finished my diploma, and I think it was about four months or something, I finished my diploma, I said, well, look, I've still got more time and I, I need to be doing things. And um, I found the uh, course with Griffith University, the postgraduate for safety leadership with Sydney Decker. Um, actually, sorry, can I, I'll skip back six months prior to that. Prior to that, they didn't have anybody in, their, in the whole city doing safety, a uh, relatively small city. And they said, mm -hmm. well, why don't you become the safety officer? We've never had one before. We don't really have any systems in place. You're going to have to build it from scratch. I said, well, yeah, and you know, that sounds great. So I took that offer, took that job. And then while I'm doing that, I built all this safety system as I thought, you know, that's what safety was through my surf and diploma and such forth. And I was, even within six to 12 months, I was starting to get quite disenfranchised with it because I remember creating all these documents and, you know, having all these procedures and policies and processes and um, these new rules and, you know, testing and all this kind of stuff that I brought out within a very short period of time. Um, and then I remember thinking, I'm not too sure whether I've actually brought any, have I improved anything? And then one of the colleagues I used to work with um, on actually the mowing crew came up to me and said, um, Oh, well done, Dave. You've given us all a lot more work, but you've not changed anything. And I kind of, that was like a dagger to the heart. That was like, you know, I think you might be right. I think you might be right. And then um, I, I became quite disenfranchised with safety at that point. But fortunately, skipping forward again, I found the, um, I found Griffith Uni and Sydney Decker and Tristan Casey and Drew Ray. And that opened up an entire new world into safety differently and safety too. And, New view safety and um, how we can how it is beneficial to start putting the people at the centre of what we're doing in relation to safety. And that, to be honest with you, if I hadn't found that, I don't think I would still be in safety. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a godsend for me to be honest with you to be able to stay in safety by being able to move away from that more heavy. Not that compliance doesn't have a place. Of course, it has a place. But that's all I was told safety was. Mm. Um, but then when you realize it's no, it's actually about people, it's about behavior, it's about attitudes, about values, it's about trying to find ways to to mitigate the fact that human beings will always be human beings and they'll always make mistakes. It's like, yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Let's do that instead. Let's do that as well, as well as this other stuff. So that's my that's my journey to where I am here now, really, in a nutshell. Very good, very good. You mentioned a couple of things that I'll just talk about or ask a few things about. Um, talked about uh, downturn in resource industry. What's yeah. your gut feeling? Are we are we heading into another one? It's interesting, you know, because um, in my current capacity working for Barclays, um, some of my recent work has been with um, doing um, focus groups and one on, well, I suppose one on one interviews for a large mining resource company. I'm not going to mention names, but, um, and I, I was given the finance department, um, as a way of, you know, as a, as a group of people to talk to mm -hmm. by this particular focus group sessions that we were talking about. And in that cohort of individuals that I was talking to very, very senior, um, finance um, and industry analyst was talking to me uh, about his concerns and about what worries him. And his concerns are that, not my words, three to five years time, he predicts a huge downturn mm -hmm. here at WA. Yeah. And he would know more than I would. I mean, it, it's, his, it's his job, it's his daily life, you know, to, to plan ahead for these things and to think, you know, about the finances of the organization moving into the future. Um, him and his, him and his um, cohort and, you know, 
his industry experts as well. They're all saying that it, it is about time to, yeah. Yeah, look, that's that's my own belief. I, I think it's, to me, if I was, and I'm just a, an uneducated person, I guess, but um, I, I believe around two years there'll be a bit of a bite um, and may be significant. And I, I, I do worry because I feel like we've had a whole generation of younger workers who have entered the resource industry fairly young and all they've known is the $100,000 plus salaries and um, I think there may be a reality check coming for a few yeah. people. Um, and a lot of people, as you mentioned, you know, like young, conscientious, hardworking, a lot of them are, and, you know, they want to build a family, they want to start a life, and they, they've they built their life around this income. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it concerns me. I, I, I remember the last downturn in, in Queensland and uh, people had built literally a mortgaged up to the hilt for the McMansions and, you know, that did what back then was the thing. They'd bought a $60,000 ute then, People these days, I see, are buying ninety thousand dollar four wheel drives and stuff like that. Yeah, discussing not the price, but you know how much power it's got. I'm going. Yeah. There will be a time to pay. Um, I hope you're prepared. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. yeah. The other thing is, uh, you talked about cert fours and diplomas. I'm curious. This is me being absolutely curious. Do certificate fours and therefore and follow up to the diplomas in health and safety when you did them, did they prepare you to uh, step into industry as a safety professional? That depends. <clears throat> it depends what you class as a safety professional. Um, safety, safety is quite, a, as you're more than fully aware, it's a very diversified, multifaceted profession with, you know, you could, be in in the safety industry as a safety professional in the capacity of a environmental scientist. You could be um, a psychologist. You could be an org, org psych who specialises in um, safety aspects. You could. Um, it's a tough one because it it is. And I'm, I don't mean to belittle it, but it is only a cert four, and it, they only have mm. a certain amount of time, and they need to get the basics done. Now, mm. I think. From memory, the surf four was primarily, you know, focusing on the legislative side of things. It was mm -hmm. the compliance side of things, which again is is, I think, very much needed. Um, I think it's a good. To answer your question, I think it's potentially good entry qualification. Yep. Um, as a practitioner, um, I would hope. I would hope that it would it would spark more curiosity as well with the people who take it to know as long as they're made aware as well that this isn't the end of your journey. If anything, this is just the start of your journey. And you've got to go through that, you know, you've got to go through that 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 small narrow bandwidth of learning a little bit of information to then come out the other side and go, okay, well, actually the world's a lot bigger than what I initially thought it was. And where do I want to move within this industry? Um I don't know whether that answers your question, but it's. I think it's a good entry. It's a good, but it's a good entry to the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Um, well, what's I, your thoughts? Because you you do a lot of work with Train West, don't you? I do. I do. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've had concerns for some time over many years that the old the old cert for health and safety qualification. They used to come with a little descriptive statement about what. The qualification would mean you could do, you know, when you finish it, skills and knowledge. And it said Cert 4 means that you could effectively work as part of a safety team and a diploma meant you could effectively lead a safety team. Right, okay. And I, for the diploma in particular, I struggled to see how some people going through that would ever lead anything um, effectively. Um, yeah. And that's just me being honest. Um I still see today that to get into a health and safety advisor position, most companies are just relying on the cert for. Yep. So I'm hoping they give them 
training, mentoring and that down the track. But um, I don't know. I don't know. There was an, speaking of Andrew Barrett, there was an interesting uh, post on LinkedIn he did earlier this week where a major companies called him in to coach the senior health and safety advisor yep. about some basic principles about safety. And he was concerned about that. And I'd, the thing I'd say is, yes, you've got right to be concerned, but congratulations to the company for realising the person needs some coaching and going ahead and organising it. Um, yeah. I would be interesting. I, I briefly saw that post, but um, I'd be interested in in how they went about doing that and how, how welcome was that, you know, with, with the senior leader was that forced upon them or was that something mm. that they willingly accepted and you know that they they may have even gone to the leadership team and said you know his boss or her boss and said look you know i think i need some some more mentoring i'll i'll use the word mentoring because i think yep. in that case it was the giving of advice which we may get into it later on strictly speaking isn't coaching yep. uh, but we might get into that a bit later on but if that person volunteered into that, then great. You know, that shows humility, that shows a curiosity, a willingness to develop and learn. But if it was forced upon them, it may actually do more harm than good. But, I mean, that would I, I don't know the specifics of that case. Nah, but, you're right. It would be interesting. Mm. I'll say this. At least the company didn't throw the person under the bus and just say, you're gone, you're out of here. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you don't know. I mean, this whole thing may have been, as I said, I, I, I don't know the, the actual specifics, it may have been part of a performance improvement plan. Mm. Uh, so they can actually say, we've asked you to do this, we've asked you to do that, and you provided this mentoring, coach, whatever you want to call it, and you're still not performing, so out you go. It could be part of that process. I yeah. don't know. But, um, yeah. The specifics are, are where the, you know, where the real gems are in cases like this. But knowing Andrew... Andrew is a very conscientious, uh, intelligent, um, caring person as well. Mm. Um, so he would have handled it with yeah, diplomacy and professionalism either way. Um, yeah. All right. Speaking of coaching, what is an organisational coach? That's a big question. That's like saying what's a, what's a safety professional or what's a safety practitioner. And you know what? This is the one thing... It, this one word causes so much uh, confusion, this word coaching. And we touched on it briefly a couple of minutes ago, talking about that particular instance with Andrew Barrett. Um, and I've had conversations with people who I would have thought would have been able to understand what an organizational coach is and really had difficulty with that. So what I've started doing, and I hope it's all right with you, is yep. going through more what it isn't. Um, because I find when I tell people what it isn't, that sparks more curiosity from the people and they go, okay, well, that's, that's what I thought it was. So if you're telling me it's not, then that seems to be a better place from starting from, as opposed to telling people my version of what I think it is. Mm -hmm. So strictly speaking, organizational coaching isn't giving advice, isn't an expert telling somebody else how to do something it's not um it's not someone providing solutions mm. um, and it's not someone who needs to know anything about the work that you do the industry you're in or the job that you perform so that's what it isn't mm -hmm. you don't it's none of that what it is it's it's a <laughs> What is organizational coaching? Organization, it's it's a powerful tool. It it works in the premise. It, it was developed by a guy, partially developed by a guy called Sir John Whitmore in England. And it came out of the, actually, it actually came out of sports coaching around tennis and golf players. Mm -hmm. The problem with the historical view of coaching is, in order, if you can only learn from someone who's better than you, you have to have the best in the world teaching you. But then they're the. If you don't have access to that best person in the world, how are you supposed to improve? Mm. So, and that person is only the best in the world because of the way that they view the world or the way that they view that particular task. 
sport and the meaning that they put on everything around that. So John Whitmore found out that performance can be improved if you remove interference. So there's generally organizational coaching falls into a few different frameworks, but a very popular one is called GROW, mm. model of GROW. Yeah. And that's an acronym. That's broken down into goals, reality, opportunity, and will. So it's a process you go through with your counterpart or you and your client. And you, it's a conversation. It's a structured conversation whereby the organizational coach talks to the client about what it is that they want to achieve. Now, because it's organizational, usually that's a split responsibility between the organization needs this particular person to be a better leader and needs them to be a better safety practitioner, it needs them to be something, or they want to be something which benefits the organization. So that's where the organization comes into it. It's generally through a lens of what the organization wants or needs, or what the person wants or needs to perform better within the organization, as I mentioned. But there are inherent, um, there are inherent uh, um, um, obstacles that every individual will face. Mm -hmm. um, be them internal, it, thought processes, um, you know, limitations around self belief, um, aspects of always being given information and always being told what to do and therefore not having the confidence to think through solutions themselves, not even having the space to create that thought process and to think through options and be given that space to come to your own realizations about what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and what you need to do and what you can do and thinking through those options. This is a long-winded way of saying organizational coach is all about the counterpart. And it's about helping them remove their own either internal or external interference in order to improve their performance. So the formula of which, which Sir John Whitmore came up with is performance mm. equals um, uh, it's performance equals potential minus interference. Mm. So if you want to improve your performance, concentrate on what your potential is and then what's getting in the way of that potential. Yep. Yep. And yep. you can do that, as I mentioned at the beginning, without knowing anything about the industry the person works in. Yeah. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated and actually harder for the coach when you, as with myself, I've got my own company called New View Safety Coaching, when the coach is also a professional or a practitioner within the and within that industry, because it's harder for me then as a coach, because I have to withhold information that I think may be of benefit to the counterpart or the coachee, purely because it's not about me giving that information as a quick fix. I, I wrote a blog post recently on my website called, you know, the quick, fi the quick fix of the sugar high versus being given answers and solutions all the time. Mm. You're better off going through the process of coming to the solution yourself. So where the organizational coaching and the safety practitioner professional comes into it, I said it, it makes it harder, but it's more about guidance then. It's more about me not giving advice, but knowing where they, they need to go in order to be able to get to where they want to get to and guiding the conversation and, and well, I suppose they're searching their, their internal dialogue so they find those solutions themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I've always thought I've of it. Answer there, sorry. About no, that. that's all right. I always thought of that model as um, some pretty deep and meaningful self self reflection. Where again, you say you don't provide the answers, you provide the structure, and the person's already got the solutions, the answers. They know what has to be done. Exactly. But exactly. you're getting getting them to elicit it. Yes. Yeah. And that carries with it so much more benefit than just being given answers all the time. Um, you're more likely to do it for starters if you come up with it. You're more likely to stick with it and not drop it at the first failure or the first hurdle. You're more likely to adapt it 
if you've come up with it. Because if someone else has given you the solution and it doesn't work, you go, oh, well, they give me the, that, that solution. It's not working. Let's get rid of it and start again on something else. Mm-hmm. If you've created the solution yourself, you might like to go, oh, okay, well, yeah, that small 5 or 10% of it didn't work. That doesn't mean we've got to get rid of everything. Let's just tweak that because I created the solution anyway. Let's tweak that 10% and see what happens and see if we can make the solution then work. And if not, you know, there's a lot more ownership. There's a lot more ownership um, if you create it yourself. Yeah. Very good. You mentioned uh, New View Safety Coaching. Yep. What's it do? (sighs) Yeah, well, exactly what I've just been rattling on about, (laughs) waffling on about for the past couple of minutes, which is, look, my, my, I got into, um, as I mentioned, I got into, Safety differently, new view, those aspects, whatever you want to term it, it's it's um there's lots of different names going about. They've got a few shared common beliefs, deference to expertise, um, error is normal, you know, blame fixes nothing. And these are a few terms that people will be able to resonate with. But essentially, essentially for me, new view is is elements of all of this and specifically about focusing on what can be done, what can be achieved and the capacity that can be built as opposed to trying to prevent the negative. I think I can't remember who it was that said that trying to improve safety by, by stopping the negative is like only, only studying divorces. If you want to, if you want to know what makes a great marriage and, you know, I agree with that as well. So, and that aligns very well with aspects of, you know, positive psychology, psychology in general, you know, about it's more about the individual, it's more about the people. So I enjoyed that aspect of it. More about the people. Yes, yes, definitely. And then uh, about three, four years ago, with my current employer, um, I got introduced to organizational coaching. We're all certified organizational coaches. And I was able to take that aspect of that new view safety safety differently whatever you call it and also um have those one-on-one conversations with professionals who were looking to do these types of things and it wasn't just about safety differently it was also about leadership in particular as well um and every once in a while you're going through life and you find something that really just sits well with your personality type with your skill sets with your interests and um these are two of the things that really get me up in the morning that provide me purpose that um i i i love learning about i will um uh, i love talking about i love sharing and um i love the end effect as well um so what i did was i thought well okay let's take these two passions that i've got these two in interests and let's put them together and see if anybody else has um uh, well see if this can be of benefit to anybody else Mm -hmm. so that's what new view safety is it's the it's the amalgamation of my two passions um and um made public made manifest and put out there in the world and then hopefully um as i said hopefully it can be of benefit to some other people out there as well good good now I think anyone who knows me knows that I'm certainly not a bean counter in any shape or form. <laughs> but uh, tell me, if I engage you to come and uh, work with my organisation or any organisation, what's some of the benefits I can expect? Look, there are a lot of organisations out there, some of them that I've 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 done my certification through called um, EICL, Executive um, uh, Coaching and Leadership. Um, and they provide a lot of reports, annual reports on on return on investment mm-hmm. for organizational coaching. I think this is getting to the point of what you asked, asked really. Um, and there is a lot of hard evidence um, out there to support when you support your leaders with organizational coaching, you not just make them more effective, you make the teams that they're responsible for more effective as well. It cascades through. Um, 
I don't know the metrics with which they use in order to be able to measure these things. It's very, to be honest with you, I'm not a bean counter either. I do have a page on my website which talks about return on investment, and I put a lot of links there to other organizations because it's not really my area of expertise either. Um, what I do know is that you wouldn't get the largest organizations in the world doing this if there wasn't a tangible, quantifiable return on investment. Um, they just wouldn't bother doing it. Um, so they do do it for a reason. And the reason is because it helps leaders, individuals, become better at their job and become better for their organization. Um, yeah. And happier, and happier as well, doing their work, more confident, helps raise self-insight. It's not just something that people who receive organizational coaching, it's, it's not like the benefits aren't purely for work only either as well. You know, these part of the, Part of the process of going through organizational coaching is to actually, the coach is there to hold up a mirror to, to the other person so that they can get a reality check on exactly what they're saying, what they're doing. Now, the, what this helps with, it helps raise self-awareness, helps raise um, awareness of what they're saying and what they're doing and how that impacts the world around them that's something that's not just going to benefit the organization. That's going to benefit their, pr their private life as well as their organizational performance requests as well. So it, it's even inside industry, it's, it, it does have tangible return on investment. But I would say more than that, the intangible is the benefit to the individual in the community as well. And the community is everything from you know, them, their family, how they're situated in their neighborhood, how they're situated within their city. You know, it's it's a it's a community benefit. It's a community benefit. Yeah, I I seem to be dwelling remembering something of the back of my mind. Someone said uh, in safety in particular, not everything that is measured is meaningful, and not everything meaningful is measured can be measured. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. That, there's a lot of truth to that. There is so much truth there. Um, I'm just curious. You talked about, again, New View, Safety 2, or these things. Maybe I'm off the mark, but I'm sure you can correct me if I'm wrong. For me, all of that new beliefs is basically just saying people-centred safety. Yes. You know, we involve the people. We use the skills, the knowledge, experience of people to come up with solutions. And I don't know, we protect the people. It's not about process. It's not about paperwork. It's not about ticking boxes. It's just about the people. Is that kind of on the money? That's, well, I mean, that I would, all these terms and phrases will mean different things to different people, depending on their lens on life and you know the meaning that they've taken from life, their, their ontological view of the world as well. So I would say your view that you just outlined there, that aligns very well with my view of, of what these concepts and theories are talking about as well. Yeah, it's, it's, and you know, people get real tribal real quick when you start talking about different names and, Things like and I always remember the article by, by Clive James when he's talking about, he's on LinkedIn as well. The, you know, let's have less of the navel gazing. Let's have less of this name battling out. You know, let's have less of I'm right, you're wrong because this works for me and that doesn't work for me. And this name is doesn't fit with it. Let's have enough of that. Let's have enough of that. Let's just do exactly what you said then, Tom. Let's make this about what it's really about, protecting our people protecting the people that is and we lose sight of that so easily when you know we got all this detail and especially along with all this tribalism it gets so brutal on on linkedin at times when people trying to prove other people right and wrong and it's horrible but yeah i agree with you mate i agree with you it's about the people people-centric safety good all right now your your lovely business new view safety coaching are you only focusing on West Australian clients or you're available to do this anywhere? Well, that's, the, that's, look, that's a great question. And that's one of the, um, uh, I suppose, 
benefits of COVID, if you can say that COVID had any benefits. Um, and that would be exactly what we're doing now, this communication semi-face to face. I mean, we can see each other, um, but it's through an online medium. Mm. And um, prior to COVID, I would I would hazard a guess, please don't hold me to these numbers, but I would hazard a guess that you would have a coach that was in your city or at least in your state, and you would go and meet face to face and you would have those appointments face to face. Since COVID, um, you know, the world has changed. As we know, um, you know, we're not face to face. We're doing this online as well. And although it isn't as easy because there are a lot of elements of body language, a lot of elements of reading situations, people, how they're holding subtle changes that they make that you might miss. I can't see your, I can't see anything below your elbows. So I don't know what you do with your hands or your fingers. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if you're cross-legged. I don't know if you're twitching. I don't know if, if what I'm saying is making you uncomfortable. So there are subtle cues that, that are missed, but the benefit of this, of, uh, uh, you know, this online platforms and mediums is that it's world, you know, it's the world. It's, you can operate anywhere if um, it's not ideal. It's not always ideal but you can, um, and it's more and more prevalent. And a lot of coaching now is done, a lot more coaching now is done online than it is face-to-face, -face, purely because of time, distance, cost. It, you know, cost can be brought down if you don't have to travel yeah. an hour or two to go meet the client and then an hour or two back, and then you've missed out on several of the appointments that you may be able to have. You can have them almost back-to-back -back as well. So, yeah, yeah. It is, is, it's a great advancement let's put it that way good good all right uh some questions just about your beliefs in safety and a few things personal here so if you had to pick one individual one individual who has influenced your thoughts on safety the most who would it be see i feel that if and i was thinking about uh, i was thinking about this earlier I feel that as soon as, as soon as anyone mentions a name, some people are going to say, oh, well, yeah, but they don't do this or they do do that or they don't do the other thing. But I'm going to put all that aside and just say this person's name because it's Todd Conklin. Hmm. Um, and I think it's because he's such a great storyteller. Yes. Um, he's a fabulous communicator. He's a great presenter. Um, he's uh, he, he's credible. He's very credible. He's an org site, you know, doctorate. And mm -hmm. He's run a safety department, and I know, you know, what he has his flaws. Um, he he doesn't necessarily always um, help with implementation side of things, and it's all it's all about what could be to a degree. But if you take that and you build on it and you use it to your benefit, then um, I'd say I like good storytellers. I like people who can, you know, who can, who can create a metaphor and then um, make that a meta example as to, as to what you can do with an organization or a theory such as safety. You know, it's, I, I love telling, retelling his stories, you know, when he's sitting on the plane and he's talking about when he's the first time he saw the article of, I think it was Volvo who said they've got a fatality free car and, you know, the cars, how the car has changed over time. And, you know, all these great stories that he's got are good ways for me as well to be able to translate safety to new view, whatever it is to other people. Because mm -hmm. otherwise we're just left with our, our, you know, our own interpretation and that may not resonate so much with people. So I think what Todd has given me more than any other practitioner in the, in the space and why you know i see, i go back repeatedly to his videos is because he he gives me that that story he gives me that narrative to be able to remind myself but also to be able to communicate it to other people as well um yeah so i'd say i'd say he's been the most influential in this space yeah i i, I do like the man i do like the man enough i, I when you when you mentioned about uh measuring a good marriage by a divorce. That's a Todd quote. That's, That's a Todd, Todd quote. quote. And um, I got to be honest. And say, it's a Complanism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when when we were moving down from Port Hedland down to Perth, sixteen hours of driving, 
And we went in two cars, my wife driving one car with the cat and I, because the cat and the dog at that stage weren't really like getting on. Me and the dog were in the, the lead car <laughs> and it, it, really boring. But I had, I listened to 16 hours of Todd on the way yeah. down and um, yeah, and very, 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 very happy. Very people very happy. Well, it? Yeah, that does well. All right. May uh, be the same answer, but we'll see. All right, if you could, I know because I've actually had, I've actually had a series of brilliant mentors in my life. Um, uh, my father passed when I was five years old and uh, missed out on good or bad male stereotypes. Some people say bad, I missed out on. But <laughs> the thing is, you'll never know. Um, but I've had some good mentors along the way, some absolutely brilliant people who've been in my life. So. If you could choose a mentor for David Woolwich from now on in, who would it be? Um, I'm fairly similar to you um, in regards to lacking out on a particular mentorship in my youth. I had three fathers by the age of 10 years old. Um, and, I, you know, I think deep down there's always been that search for that father figure in my life type, type of thing. I think... And quite a lot of guys, I think that's quite common with a lot of guys, especially people like us as well, who have you know, lacked that maybe in our younger years. Um, to answer your question, I've been fortunate enough to work, as I'm sure you are as well, with some very amazing people over the past 10 years. And um, there's a gentleman known here in Perth. He's actually quite well known in the safety space as well. A guy called um, um, Tony Whitcomb. Um, and I've had the absolute pleasure of, of working with him. He used to be my boss. Um, and, you know, although we no longer work together, he still makes time to come to every single one of my book clubs. He still makes time to catch up for coffee and to ask me how I'm doing in my life and to provide advice and sage advice and um, guidance and that um that solid, calm base that we sometimes need to be able to just go and put our thoughts and feelings out there and let someone gently and respectfully comment and guide and support you. Um, and he is um, he's an amazing individual. And he, I'm proud to say that he is my, my mentor. And I'm... Um, He's, he's also from the northeast of England, which just happens to be where I'm from as well. We're actually, <laughs> where we were born is probably stone throw from each other, um, uh -huh. although he's older than me, which you won't like me saying. But um, yeah, we've, we're both northeastern boys from the UK, and I, I, I'm not sure whether that has something to do with it as well. You know, there's a, there's a, shared, there's a shared commonality there from our heritage and from our history and, you know, from where we're born. And we've got similar accents and, you know, things like that. So yeah, Tony Whitcomb. Beautiful. Shout out to him. He's an amazing man. Beautiful. All right. Um, we're getting close. So I'm going to ask you some quick questions and you're going to give me. I'll try and give quick answers then. <laughs> Maybe a little quicker. We'll see. All right. Uh, let's have a look. If you could to eliminate one thing from modern safety practices, what would it be? Arrogance. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. Is that a quick one? Yeah, look, I, I'm going to add in there. I wouldn't have termed it like that, but it's a dead on the money. Thinking we know better than people yep. how to do their job and how to keep them safe. Yeah, 100%. Good work. That's that's made me think. All right. Safety culture. Some people say it's there. Some people say it's not. Some, people, But for you, culture, safety culture, the most important component of it for David Woolwich would be? Curiosity. Cool. Excellent. Cool um, and this is the strap line for my business as well, coaching for curiosity. I think if you have curiosity um, generally, then you're always striving to improve. Can I just take it back a little bit? I want to take it back to that arrogance because I just have this thought. Yep. Sometimes I've thought leaders whether they be safety leaders safety advisors or just leaders in general yep. 
when they come across as very arrogant, that they feel like they know better than anyone else or they try and make out that. It took me a while, but I equate that to being insecure in your role. Would that kind of be correct? It's, I, I think the psychology behind it might be, might be that they are insecure, therefore they've got to double down on what they're doing. It's the only thing they know. They may be scared to do to try something else, um, or they may genuinely believe that their their way is the only way, and everyone's going to do what they tell them and how how to do it. I I really don't know. I know I, what I do know is that if you do have someone who's overly arrogant, and narrow minded, and single viewed, it really doesn't. It, it it's really not good enough for organisations in this dynamic environment we're in, in this VUCA world, you know, that we're living in, it's far too dynamic, it's far too uncertain, far too complex for anyone to have all the answers. Yep. Um, and the arrogance is is a manifestation of that mm. in an individual. Um, yeah. Yeah. No I there at all. I ask safety supervisors literally every week this question. I ask them, do they think they need more policies and procedures they to follow or more paperwork to fill out? Yeah. What, what do you reckon their answer is? Or, oh, right, what do I think their answer is? Yeah, what do you think their answer is? I would say they would. They think, yes, they do need more. You'd be surprised. Not a single person has said we need more policies and procedures, more paperwork. Really? So the, the follow-up question for you is, does more safety-related paperwork for you, does it equal safer workplaces? Um, and I'll try and answer this quickly as well because I know that I can waffle on. Um, I've been fortunate in the role that I'm in for the past three years to be exposed to a myriad of different organisations all over Australia. Mm -hmm. Some of them have got what other people might consider conflated and bloated safety management systems, but actually work really well. And some people, some organizations have very minimal stuff that doesn't, that doesn't work at all. So I think the answer for me isn't about the quantity, it's about the quality. Good. Is the quality there? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Do people, can people get the information they need in a timely manner and do they know how to get it? I think, um, I think it's, I don't think it's a quantity argument. I think it's a quality argument. And to that point as well, I'll quickly throw on the back end of that usability mapping. Uh, Klaus Hoffer, um, document engineering, whatever you want to term it, I would say if it, if it's not something that's on your radar as a safety professional at the moment, get it on your radar because it makes it is new view safety differently theory put into paper. Um, it, it's it's humanizing information on paper so humans can access it better. It's amazing. It's amazing. Fantastic. All right, uh, last question, last question. What's one quality above all others that every safety professional should have? I think I know what your answer is going to be, but let's go with it anyhow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the same word we've touched on a lot, and one of my favourite words is curiosity. It's, um, you know, curiosity sparks self-insight. Um, it, it sparks improvement in the environment around you. Um, it's the big what if question. Um, uh, what if we did this? What would that look like? How might we be able to do this? It's working pretty well at the moment. Can it work any better? It's not working pretty well. Is, is this new thing we're trying to do, is that going to make it worse? You know, these are all great questions which um, every safety professional should be asking themselves. And there are no answers. There are no golden um answers to it but just having that curiosity i think is is uh, such a great foundation a great foundation for any safety professional beautiful david wallach it's been an absolute pleasure as always speaking to you it's uh, been amazing talking to you too tom and uh that unfortunately that's it for the day but uh, i do look forward to speaking to you again soon same here mate thank you for coming to the and the book club events as well. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, 
stay safe, and enjoy the rest of your week.